is the Math Map Book Club, where ordinary parents encourage one another to develop an extraordinary appreciation of math. We love what we know and struggle over the unfamiliar. Through weekly conversation and exploration among friends, we can begin to enjoy ideas that seem difficult. Join our book club as we discover how math helps us to know God and to make Him known. Let me find... There we go. All right. Well, usually Lee has, um, I, I need to probably get the script from Lee for what I'm supposed to say now. Um, but welcome to the book club. Um, we are excited that we're getting close to uh, the sale date for the curriculum. And we're glad you're all here. Uh, Lee is not joining us today. Um, I know you, she usually keeps a pretty close eye on the chat box. Um, and there are several of you who are great about the chat. But if you see something that um, I need to address, please, um, please go ahead and point that out to me. And Emma just prompted me and said that I'm supposed to say the date. And so today is March the 20th, <clears throat> uh, 2024. So thanks for being here. Uh, we are uh, cruising through our year, going two weeks at a time. Uh, we're actually going to finish up 3D today, uh, which means we'll be in 4D next week. Uh, we are using the naturals as our lesson pages, although I'm certainly happy to answer questions from uh, materials that are not um, included in the naturals. So, so please feel free to ask those questions. Uh, are there any, before we jump into the lessons this week, are there any questions that are pressing in? May I just say that I listened to the Everyday Educator podcast yesterday, and I was so encouraged because the power of a map with Lee, Lisa interviewing Lee and her vision for it. It was beautiful. I would love a transcript of it. We need to use that wording and practicum planning because I'm a PSS. And as I'm doing these meetings with my Rising Challenge A parents, there's just this cloud of fear. And it, should, it was beautiful to hear Lee share her heart and her vision for it because these parents have just, put these kids, they've checked out in fifth grade math. They're putting the kids in front of screens and they're looking at the complex booklets for the first time. Some of them already opted in emails. They had no clue what it was. And so as I'm trying to encourage them to go to the mathmap.com, go to the naturals on connected, come to these recordings of these book clubs, that it's just beautiful to see how the curriculum just brings you back to God. It's encouraging, redeeming our education. It's beautiful. I sent it to my AR in all caps. Everyone must listen to this podcast, please. And I'm not even a podcast listener. That's probably the fourth one in my life. So I would love a transcript, Lisa. So this is really encouraging. And I also saw on the website, May 1st, it looks like you're starting over with something... We you speak yes. to that or you already did that? Sure. Yeah. So we, um, as you can see here, we've, after this week, we're going to have one, two, three, four weeks left, which will get us to, um, about mid April. And then, uh, last summer we took the summer off. We're not going to do that this summer. We, um, anticipate there's going to be a lot more people that are working through the summer, uh, this year. And, so our goal is to go by uh, dimension over the summer. So instead of going through the weeks, we're going to go through the dimensions. So the first one will be 0D, 1D, 2D, 3D, so forth. And we're going to do that three times. Um, and they will be a little less, um, a little bit less organized, maybe is the word, um, than, than we've done here, where we're, we're going to really hope that people bring their questions to that book club time we will have some things that are prepared um, if nobody brings anything um, but the goal is is hoping that we're going to have people working through things at home bringing things that they want to discuss and so that's what the format will look like over the summer and then once we get to august we're going to switch to a different uh, a slightly different format looking at things in another way so we're 
just like our students are going to do, right? We're going to continue working through the dimensions, working through those topics. Um, each iteration of the book club, we're just trying to change that up a little bit just so that we can keep that conversation fresh. Thank but you. yeah, this is, and, and even though the, the book club might say 0D or 1D, people can bring their questions from any dimension and any, any lesson, um, you know, and not feel like they have to wait. So please encourage your families um, or your friends to show up with the book club uh, this summer and bring, bring their questions and we will be happy to discuss them. All right, well, let's go ahead and look at our lesson. So our lesson this week is lesson 21 and it's titled extending, um, this, this part here is extending properties of 2D figures to 3D. Um, the lesson is called locations. Um, so let's go ahead and pause for a minute and give you a chance to look at that page and then share some things that may be familiar and some things that may be unfamiliar. I would say the word locus is probably going to be unfamiliar to a five or six year old. Where might locus be familiar from for some of our older students? If it's if the math idea of locus is not familiar, where else may they have encounter that word? Latin? Abs, you are on it today. Yes, right. <laughs> locus is Latin, right? And so locus probably is, It. Is, I think, I'm going to be honest with you here. I think locus is one of the harder ideas that we're going to talk about in the math map. And I think that Lee has done a good job of um, breaking it down into pieces. But anytime we think of when people use the term in mathematics, and they talk about locus, um, they often times don't always define it well. And so if we take our Latin skills and we define it, um, does anybody know what the definition of locus is? I can master Latin. In, yeah, if you're translating in, locus to English, what does it mean? A location. Okay. Location, Would be right? The, the simple, right? Yep, that's it. So it's the same thing in math. It is a location. It's just that how we describe it in math is maybe feels a little bit different. All right. Because instead of saying um, it's located at um, 255 Grant Street, right? There's a location that we can all put our, our head, wrap our heads around. Um, and so our mathematical locus may not use that same type of addressing. Instead, it may say, for example, it's the set of points that are the same distance from one point, right? And so now we're, we're going to have to go back and think <clears throat> through our grammar and go, what have we learned about that was a set of points that was all the same distance from one point? And we might go, oh, that was a circle, all right? So we we may have some, and I'm going to use the word simple just to mean like one part locus, right? So that would be a fairly simple locus where there's just one thing. Um, but I could also have um, complex, meaning that there's multiple parts to a locus. Most of what we're doing here are going to be fairly simple um, loci or loci, Kathy. CC pronunciation, loci or loci? I would go loci. What is it in math? Is it at loci? Well, it depends on what dictionary you look at. So, yeah. all right. So we'll go with loci because we want it to be nice and consistent for our students. And so um, as I look at those different loci, the, those complex loci may just mean that it has to um, have several things that it satisfies. Right. So we do this um, without realizing it a lot of the times. 
Because even if I said 255 Grant Street, right, I'm giving you two, two things that it has to satisfy, right? It has to satisfy that it's on Grant Street, but there's a lot of businesses that are on Grant Street. And then the other piece of information is that its number is 255. Well, there's a lot of places in the world that have the number 255, but there's only one that is 255 on Grant Street. So that could be thought of as a complex locus because I've given you two pieces of information about an address, a location, and I have to satisfy them both. The difference with math and what makes it challenging in math is that we have to draw on our memoria a lot of the times to recognize right what what sets of points we're describing right so if I don't necessarily remember the definition of a circle or the definition of a sphere it makes it a lot harder right to know what i'm talking about and so this is a really great example of why learning math classically Investing that time in learning the grammar is going to help us when we encounter ideas like this. Because if I'm really familiar with the grammar of triangles and polygons and circles and angles, then finding different loci, different locations is going to be a lot more accessible to me than if I don't know any of those things, right? Because all I'm doing here is I'm saying, illustrate or find the location that satisfies all of these different things, right? Um, if you don't know where Grant Street is, does that help you to know where the Math Map office is? No, right? So you need the grammar of knowing where Grant Street is before you can find the Math Map. And it's the same idea here. So I just, I just kind of wanted to talk through that word of locus a little bit because um, to really encourage us that we have to know our grammar in order to be able to really interact with this well. Um, but the way that Lee has set the lessons up, I think that it's gonna really help to step people through and see what we're doing. All right, any questions on our first page here or anything you'd like to share that you've noticed? All right, let's look at page two. I, oh. I do have a question with that last page. Sure. Just that the top square, is that Spider-Man <laughs> on, on the right? I... I just did this with my with my 11 year old and he asked who that was. And I said, it looked like possibly Spider-Man. <laughs> it's an astronaut. I was gonna say, I think it's an astronaut. It's an astronaut. And then the dog has an astronaut helmet on it too. Yeah. The astronaut is on the top right square. Yeah. Yes. Huh. I don't. And, okay. then it, and then it ties in with the doggy on the right of the 3D. Okay. Okay. I think he liked the Spider Man idea, but the astronaut <laughs> probably seems a little more well, <laughs> understandable. Here, if, if your son likes the Spider Man <laughs> connection, then I would go just with go that. with that because. Well, we did. Yeah. We colored yeah. in Spider Man. So. That's great. Right, so as as the math map, right, we have to be careful of other people's uh, property. So we couldn't put Spider-Man there, but you at home certainly can. And so, right, that's the joy of homeschooling is that you can make these fit your student, right? You could have somebody who really likes Spider-Man uh, or Superman and draw a little cape. All right, or Wonder Woman and put her in her jet. Okay, let's look at page two. And take a minute and look for some things that are familiar and some things that are unfamiliar on this page. We know there's some things on this page that are familiar. The bridge reminds me of the one in uh, the Monet painting. Love that. 
The bridges are familiar. What else is familiar? The room, the grass. I think they're bushes, but yeah. So we've got our oh, bushes or our or our clumps of grass. The room should right looks familiar. We may be familiar with the things that are in there. In the bottom, the line in the plane. Good. The angle. So we've seen angles. I'm going to flip back to the last page. Look at the tops. So these would be facing pages if your students were working. So I want you to think about the top of this page and the top of this page. Are they similar? What was on our top left here? They're both they're both tracing pages. They are and this and one. What, what shape is in my top left? A circle. A circle. And what's my top right? A um a sphere. And so they're both they're both showing the correspondence between 2D and 3D. Good. They're both the 2D and 3D. The top left is a circle both times and the right is a sphere both times, right? So if we're working through this with our older students, right, we can certainly now start to look and see, okay, what was the difference between um, a 2D, the 2D locus and the 3D locus. And now what's the difference? We are seeing it instead of in words, we're being given um, an equation. So our, our older students, we can dive in a little bit deeper. But even for our younger students, right, recognizing, hey, I'm talking about a circle both times. I'm talking about a sphere both times, right? What are the things that are familiar? Okay. And so I just, I always want to come back to that because when we ask our students what is familiar, it doesn't have to be that they know the math, right? It doesn't have to be anything that's in depth, uh, any great mathematical truth that's familiar to them. It's helping them to look at a page that may feel overwhelming and find something on that page that's restful, right? Even if it's just, if it's a bridges or if it's the bushes or if it's an angle or a circle, right? I know what that is because then we can build on that with something that's unfamiliar, right? So I might say, um, the I know that those are bridges, right? It's familiar to me because I know that they're bridges, but I've never seen them drawn with an arrow through. Well, what does that mean, right? Um, and then we could read above. It says a line through the middle of two bridges. Oh, okay. Now I now I get it that that's what that line is there. It's it's in the middle of these two bridges. Um, so that's where I can take that familiar and build my unfamiliar. So just want to encourage everybody, right? That there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to the familiar and the unfamiliar. And it doesn't have to be in depth, that it's finding that it's getting our kids to think through what's on the page instead of just shutting down and going, I can't do any of this. Um, it's really prompting them and encouraging them, right? To look at it and go, well, there's gotta be something on here I know. All right, let's look at page three. Equations and conic sections. And let's go ahead and take another minute and everybody try to find something that's familiar or something that's unfamiliar and go ahead and share that. In the top two boxes, you again have 2D and then 3D. Good. The symbol with the for plane is unfamiliar. Okay. I think noticing, or I'm noticing maybe for the first time, how it seems like there's a, what you might say, a math concept at the top, even though I know the whole thing is math, but that large middle section is, doesn't look heavy to them, you know, on all three of the pages we've looked at so far, a nice, big section in the middle that doesn't look heavy. What's that image down in the bottom right corner? It's a party hat. Party hat, right? So it's familiar, right? I 
would say that top right box is unfamiliar just because okay. of the picture and the symbols it looks more unfamiliar than some of the other pictures are there any parts of that that are familiar babs i mean the word plain is familiar okay. i guess the Good. the a b is that like a ray or a line a line yeah a line okay So, so we can take something, right? So we're, we've honed in and we've gone, this looks really unfamiliar, but then as we dive down into it, we're like, okay, so what is familiar? Well, that line is familiar, right? I've been dealing now with lines in 1D and 2D. Now I'm seeing them in 3D. So this idea of lines, that's familiar. And the, the word plane is familiar. Can I connect that word plane to any part of the image? Which part of the image is the plane? The ones that have the label with P1 and P2. Okay, good. So so the I'm gonna call them rectangles, although they're right, because that's what they are, but they're representing our plane. So now I've taken my image and I suddenly see, okay, how many planes do I have? Two. Two. And what's the relationship between the planes? Perpendicular. It might be perpendicular, but they're they definitely. They intersect. Intersection. Intersecting, right? So they're definitely intersecting. So now I've taken something that felt really overwhelming and I've gone, well, wait a minute. I know that this thing is a line. I know that there's two planes and I figured out what part of my diagram is the planes. Looking at it, I've gone, well, they're intersecting. And where is the line in relation to their intersection? It's actually where they're intersecting in the middle. It's actually where they're intersecting. So now here's a, here's a question. What kind of shape is the intersection of two planes? A line. A line. Right? So we just we just started with things that were familiar and asked one more question and one more question and we got to a mathematical truth. Right? Using materials that were designed for five and six year olds. Right? And and so um, I just want to encourage us all, right? That it's so tempting, right? And I've been there, right? Like I I've taken classes and I read math books and I am right there with you. It's so tempting to shut down and go, this is too much. Um, but if we can can focus in and find one thing to build on, then we can eventually get it to the point where we're figuring out what it's telling us um, because we just looked at it piece by piece instead of looking at it all together. Good job. All right. And page four um, this page uh, is about time conversion. Um, and so um, we're gonna, I'm just going to look at the bottom of the page. And I wanted to wish you, first of all, all a very happy astronomical spring. So today is the first day of spring. Um, so very appropriate that this is the lesson where we talk about time. And I know that a lot of people have sort of asked that question, well, where do things like time fit into the curriculum? And uh, we look at time in lesson 21 because historically, right, uh, the sun is what we use to keep time. And the sun is, uh, was used for location, right? That was used for navigation um, that you, we have something that we call local apparent noon. Okay. And so local apparent noon is where the sun is right overhead. And what I do, if I'm a if I'm a mariner, for example, I might take my sextant out and I measure um, right my angle to the sun and I measure my time. So I watch my sun through my sextant. And what I'm watching for is my sun is coming up. And then right when it gets to um, immediately above me, 
and they mark that time, we can actually figure out how far off am I from noon because I know, right, my time zone, right, our time zones are, are wide. And so just because our time in our time zone may be noon for all of us, right, there's only one moment where the sun is directly overhead. So when I figure out that difference, I can figure out where I am in my time zone and I can figure out, right, where I am on the earth, at least, right, um, my longitude is by looking at that, okay? So time matches with location really well. And so it's perfectly all right, put into this lesson. We're also now moving, right, moving along. We've talked about 0D and 1D and 2D and 3D, and we're about to start talking about 4D next week. And so we can think of time as being this dimensional bridge. And does anybody have any ideas why why we might sometimes think of time as a dimension? Probably the time travel idea has a lot to do with it. And what would we see if we could go back or forward in time and with the same people and places be there? So if it's also still happening in the present and yet I could be in another place, I'm not coincident. So I must be, look at that math term. So I must be in a different dimension. Okay, good. Does it, does it also have to do with like rates? Good, yeah, right. So if something is changing, right, whenever th we think of things changing, um, right, we're thinking of things that usually are changing in time, right? Not every rate has to do with time, but a lot of times it does. Um, if I think about, if I only have one dimension, right, so here's my, my one dimension, and I have a point here, well, if that point moves, I need a second dimension, right? to think about how that point has moved. And so that's where I might think, well, in time, right? I could say my my location in 1D at point at time one and my location in 1D at time two. Or if my whole line was to move, right? So my, my line moves, right? And so now I actually need a second dimension in order to understand what that movement looked like in time. So that's where it might be a bridge. So we went from saying it's it's kind of like a second dimension, right? If my movement was just within my dimension, but if my whole dimension moves, then now it becomes sort of this bridge that I need a second dimension, right? And if I have my 2D, right? My, my 2D, I might have a location in 2D and to describe its movement, right? Within 2D, time might be that, that third dimension or if my whole 2D moves, the beauty of sticky notes, my whole 2D note moves, right? Now we need a third dimension in order to understand that movement, right? And now let's say I have something that's in 3D, right? So I wanna drink my tea, right? So I can think of my, my teacup, right? I've got my mug and it has this location. Well, when I go to drink it, it's still in 3D, but it's moved. So time can describe, right, it's different location. If, and, and this is where we're going next week, right? If all of 3D was to move, I would need another dimension in order to understand that, right? So, so things changing in time Right, give us this idea of another dimension or a bridge to another dimension. And so that's why time is really a very powerful idea. But do we control time? No, right, Jill just talked about if we could, right? If we could go back and do different things um, or go ahead and do things, like what would we do? But we don't control it. Who does? Who established time? God, 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 right. Um, and I love that when you go back and you just read at the beginning of the Bible that it talks about how God, God is the one that established time, right? It wasn't man-made. We may have put the names to different things, 
but right, God established time. God says, this is when spring is. This is when the sun crosses the equator. That's when spring is, right? When we talk about astronomical spring, that is God, God's moment when spring starts, right? That he established that. And we're going to circle back around to that in a minute. So remember that thought. All right. So um, just to remind you of what our digital resources are, those are the things that are starred um, to the left. Our print resources, those are the solid colors and when they're being released. Um, our early adopter sale is April 23rd to May 7th. It is a significant discount on the curriculum. Um, if you order then, get your, um, and then, uh, we just really want to emphasize that the digital resources are tied to CC Connected for 2425. And um, essentially, like everything else, once you pay your curriculum and you get full access, that's when you will get access to these digital resources. So um, they are for people who are um, enrolled in a community, right? Um, so not just in CC Connected, but enrolled in a community. So once everybody is marked off as having completed their enrollment in their communities and they are given full access to CC Connected, that's when the digital resources will be available. Um, and so we want to keep saying that so that people are not disappointed on April 1st when they try to go in and see things and they don't have access. Um, we want to be really clear um, what the what that is provided for. So are there any questions on lesson 21 or the math map release? I have a question about what you just said. Does the does your child have to be enrolled in A in order to use the digital stuff? Because my we were thinking I would use it for my challenge students, but um no I won't have an A be... student. No, the digital resources will be available to everybody in CC Connected. They okay, are not great. just for Challenge A. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. April had a question early on. I think she just wanted to make sure she was using Ex Nihilo correctly. Um, I think we were trying to kind of explain to her that it's really just an overview of how to use the curriculum. But if you wanted to speak a little bit to that, just to make sure. Sure. So. Ex Nihilo, um, which I happen to have right here, um, has, has three parts to it. Um, first, um, if, if you happen to have it um, handy, you can look at it. But when you look at um, the Ex Nihilo page, this top portion of the page is a an overview of the curriculum. And so it's going to step you through the key pieces of the curriculum and explain what they're for and how to use them um, briefly. And so that's that top portion. So your first year of uh, using Ex Nihilo, that might be all you do is sort of play hide and seek where you read and it says the math map. So then you go look in your booklet, you find the math map, and you read a little bit about it to understand why that's in your booklet. Um, and then you, you move on to the next page. The middle portion um, of, of the booklet, right? So this is our introduction to zero D. Ex nihilo is our introduction to zero D. And so the purpose of the middle section of the page is to think about nothing, right? It's really to go through that idea of nothingness of zero D and, and start some conversations. So there's a lot of work with the hidden zeros and ones. Uh, we talk about that quite a bit in zero D and talk about that in ex nihilo, um, emphasizing that idea of when I write three, uh, I could have written three plus zero or one times three or three plus zero I or three times X to the zero, right? That there's a lot of different ways I could write three that all mean the same value. Um, and so that's what that middle section is. Um, and some of those are kind of thought questions. Some of it is grammar. Some of it is discussion questions. Um, but it is to make sure that every year we go back and we think through 
what is nothing, right? Um, because, you know, they, the idea that God created ex nihilo, God created from nothing, is a big idea that we don't want to gloss over um, ever. But, but especially in mathematics, where we're talking about zero, what is zero? Um, what does that mean? What does nothing mean? And if God created from nothing, let's take some time to talk about that. And so that's what that middle section is for. And again, it may be um, as you work through that, right, they're, they're the kinds of questions that for some of our younger students, they, they may not go in great depth. But as your students progress and you talk about those things with your older students, they may lead to some really great conversations. But that's that middle portion. And then finally... The bottom portion, ooh, there we go. The bottom portion here is um, a look ahead to lesson 29. So we use that term seeing the unseen to, um, to catch a, or to cast this vision of looking for truth, beauty, and goodness, and really looking for God in, math in mathematics. And so the Lesson 29 booklet is a blank booklet, and it is designed for students to fill with examples of how they've seen truth, beauty, and goodness, how they've interacted with God through mathematics. And that might mean that they're taking um, pictures of something they've seen outside, and they thought, oh, those pine trees look like parallel lines. It may be um, a problem that they did that they were really proud of and they they saw goodness in the fact that they were able to solve this problem. Um, there's so many, there's no right or wrong. And um, their goal is that it is eventually, right, with our younger students, it may not be, um, but eventually it is entirely a student-filled booklet. Um, and Lee once said, she goes, I don't want this to become another Faces of History, right, where um, people make it into something really big, which is exciting, but she said, I really want this to be something that students are doing themselves, that moms don't feel like it has to be perfect, that students are filling this. And so that bottom section, right? So this bottom section here, um, all right, let me turn off my, my background again. You can see it. Uh, none, 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 none. There we go. That bottom section there, um, notice there's a picture, and it's um, a picture from the Beetle Bounce at Legoland, if you don't have your book handy, right? And we, when we looked at this picture, we said, oh, well, look, the dad in the middle is, is kind of like mm. an origin, and we have kids on either side. So it kind of looks like the number line, right? And so um, that made us think of a number line. But then you could also say, oh, but I could also see how um, I'm counting by twos, right? So I've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, uh, 14 feet, right, from seven people. And so those are the kinds of things that could end up in, in that lesson 29 booklet, right? Where did I see math around me um, with the eventual goal that it, right, may start off with, hey, I saw this math in this activity or in this thing that I did. Um, but eventually the goal is really for that to become a record of where the student saw truth, beauty, and goodness, where they interacted with God and mathematics in creation. Um, and so that's what the bottom section of that page uh, is about. So there's several examples there that span things that your youngest student um, might want to put in to your oldest student um, as, as you fill that lesson 29 booklet. So, so those are some ways to use ex nihilo. Did that help? All right, great. Any other questions before we jump into lesson 22? Okay, let's look at lesson 22. And um, Christy, this is Shelly. Yeah. I yes. just have a question about the, uh, the release schedule. I just want to make sure I'm reading that right, that all of those starred domains are available on CC Connected in their entirety, just like we have for, I don't know, let's see, which one did I print? Um, 
naturals, I guess. So all yes. of those hard ones are going to be available during those years on CC Connected to print out. Correct. And it will be, it will not be the entirety, right? It won't have um, the frames and the charts, but yeah. it will have the cover, the contribution yeah. to the conversation, the lesson pages and the solutions pages. And then families who want to see those other pieces can go and see what those look like in our print versions um, through the companion, right? So they will have access. So for example, next year, people could go and see what those resources are um, on the screen. They won't be able to print them, but they would be able to see them on the screen in the companion. Okay. So, or what are we calling this non-formatted version or just... It's just the, it's the digital it's, version where, yeah, we're just calling it the digital version of the curriculum and that has, has those um, lesson pages and solutions pages, um, and they're going to be available until they're available in print. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Lesson 22 is called populations and, uh, has two sort of big ideas um, behind it. We're calling it populations because we are in 3D, which is our human space. And we're going to look at the canons of rhetoric and how we use those in mathematics. We're looking at our, our 15 skills of learning in lesson 22. So you're going to feel very um, entrenched in the classical method in lesson 22. And we're also going to introduce the idea of statistics uh, in lesson 22. Um, so let's just take a minute and I'm going to skip over our familiar and unfamiliar question for a minute and talk about um, the core habits of learning. So the first page, we're addressing those core habits of learning, or naming, attending, memorizing, expressing, and storytelling. We're going to look at translating words to symbols pulling those from our memoria, all of these different ways of saying the same thing. And so I've got us started here with five plus three, five and three, and three in addition to five. And what are some other ways that you might see that same equation in words? Can anybody come up with any other words? You can use the word all together, five plus three all together. I like that. Combined with. Good. Thing add five plus and three. Good. Five with three more. I like it. In the chat, Brittany said, what is the sum of the add-ins five and three? Great. If we, if we sat here, everybody would be able to come up with more, right? And so here's an example of why this is challenging for our students, because there's so many different ways that they could hear somebody say, right, what's three more than five? Or what's five then three, right? Like we keep, we could keep going. And so our students, right, need to take all of these different things, all of these different ways we can use language to express this, this, this same relationship that only has one way in when we write it with symbols, right? Five plus three, but we can do this with all these other words, right? And so, it's an easy page to, to sort of flip over because it's a lot of words when you see the chart. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of words where it's like, here's all these different words for saying the same thing. But um, as, as our students really build their memoria of math words, right? And this is why the language is so important because we really want to encourage them to be able to recognize the one math idea that we're expressing in all of these different ways. So that's that's the first page of the charts. Um, and so they're gonna be practicing that. You don't actually see it on this page here, but they're going to be seeing this idea, right? Uh, throughout this lesson, um, 
of understanding how we can take these words and translate them into symbols. Um, and I'm going to be, I'm just going to kind of speak to the charts because a lot of it, uh, this is one lesson where uh, for those of you who haven't seen the charts, um, just a reminder, they are in the middle of the booklets and they are blue pages and they are the grammar, right, for all uh, 13 years. This is, this is the grammar um, of the math map and not always. But in general, it tends to be that page one of the lesson and its corresponding pages five, nine, and 13 generally correspond to page one of the chart. And then page two and six and 10 and 14 generally correspond to page two of the chart. And three, along with seven, 11, and 15, generally correspond to page three of the charts. And then four, eight, 12, and 16 generally correspond to page four of the charts. Not always, but generally. This lesson, things are a little bit, um, are arranged just a little bit differently. Um, and you'll see things that sort of span multiple pages. So I'm going to speak um, to things that are in the charts, just because I think that you will find them encouraging to know that they're in the curriculum. Um, but you can, here's a great example of where on page one, we were talking about the words and the symbols, but they're actually practicing it on page two, right? So the way that this lesson is laid out is just a little bit different uh, to some of the others. Um, on page two of the charts, one of the things that we're gonna look at is invention and the five common topics. And we're gonna look at how those common topics um, align with um, some popular problem solving techniques. So when you hear people talk about math problem solving, we're going to help you see where they may line up with our common topics, right? That they're not some separate thing out there, but they do line up with what we're already teaching our students to do when it comes to problem solving. And really our big thing when we're problem solving with our students is invention, right? It's saying, what do you know? What do you have? What information do you need? Right? Those questions are invention questions. Um, what do I know? How does that compare to the thing that I need to know? So we're, we're working through um, helping to guide students right, to using our skills of learning and very specifically helping to see how we might apply those to some problem solving in this lesson. Um, on page three, um, this, uh, if you look at the top there, you see that we've got some arrangements on our page. Um, what are, what do we call those? And they're up, the names are on them. What are those arrangements at the top of the page? Bar graphs and pie charts. Bar graphs and pie charts. Um, now, if you notice, we, we actually have these on several pages where they do bar graphs and pie charts for your older students. Right? They may recognize that the same kind of data can be graphed with bar graphs and pie charts. Right? So there's a statistics lesson right? that we're looking at these together because we can look at the same kind of data in two different ways. Right? So I would not be looking at numerical data here. I would be looking at categorical data here. Right? How many things are in different categories? I can talk about on bar graphs and pie charts, and they're going to give me different information um, by looking at each one of those. So um, page three of the charts is looking at a lot of different arrangements. Right? And so we're going to look at different ways that we can arrange our data uh, in order to see patterns or to solve problems or to just understand what it's what we're being given. Um, as we talk about the canons of rhetoric, how might elocution and delivery be understood in a math context? Would that be like if the student can explain to you, explain the math concept back to you? 
great, right? So maybe presenting the problem back and being able to talk through it, that's good. I mean, just the vocabulary we were talking about with the different ways of saying five plus three, you know, just the different elocutions, who are you talking to? Am I talking to my parent? Then I could probably use any one of them or my teacher. But if I'm talking to a younger sibling, I might need to say it in a different way. Good. So that's elocution. That's excellent. Yeah, excellent. How about things like using the right units? Is that something that might, right? Making sure, making sure that I answer the question the way I need to answer it, that might fall under elocution. And the, how about showing my work and writing neatly? Right. So we may not have thought previously of elocution and delivery in terms of math, because a lot of times, right, we've been trained that math is one about calculation and two, once you get an answer, you're done, right? But when we think of, of mathematics in our broader context of our skills of learning, right, and our skills of language, language is always about being able to communicate our ideas to somebody else. And so we want to be able to communicate our mathematical ideas to somebody else. And so it's important to think through, how do I do that? And Donna, I love that when you said that, if I'm talking to a young student or a, maybe a challenged peer or to a parent, or maybe to a challenge plus assessor, right? The way that what I'm communicating is going to be different. And, um, right, and we wanna be able to help our students to recognize how do we communicate about math? That that's as important as just getting a right answer. All right, and then let's go ahead and look at page four. And, um, here, I wanted to pull these two ideas together because where we talked about astrological spring, which started last night at 11.06, right? That's when the sun crosses over the equator. God ordained that, right? Um, if you watch the weather on March 1st, they talked about meteorological spring. And our meteorological seasons were chosen to make statistics easier because our um, they could sit there and they say, no, every time from March 1st to May 31st, every year, that's the same period of time. And that's what we're going to talk about when we talk about our statistics. So that is man-made. So I just thought that was kind of an in fun little thing today about time and astronomical spring. And then we're also talking about statistics, which drives our meteorological spring. Um, so, and here's a question I'm going to give you a minute to think about looking at those um, Euler diagrams or Venn diagrams in the middle of the page. How would you color those triangles and squares? The things that are in both circles, you could have um, a color that blends the two or stripes or polka dots the two somehow to indicate that it contains both colors. Oh, I like that. Except that that middle one has to be the same. It has to be blue, right? Right. So that that is OK. I see. I misread. I looked at it and was not. Yes, it has not by color. You have to color. The color determines what you do because the shape is already in there. Sorry about that. I'm glad you caught that. So we don't. <laughs> so can I could I color all of those triangles blue? I, I would say no. I would say no. color the triangles three different colors because the circle on the right is describing triangles, not necessarily color as the aspect. So I would do the one in the middle would be blue and then maybe do a green and a yellow. Because if the ones on the right were blue also, mm -hmm. then they are in the wrong spot. Yeah. 
Excellent. Have you have you ever played the game set set mm -hmm. set mm -hmm. it does something really similar because you're dealing with shapes and patterns and numbers yep so it's so that's an ex i wanted to point that out because it would be i think an exercise where it just says color the polygons and kids just go through and color right and it doesn't matter but it does matter because as kathy pointed out um only the one that's in the middle can be blue because then Donna pointed out if the others were blue, they'd need to be in the middle as well, right? So um, so we need to take care, even on things that seem really simple, we need to take care to understand that. Is there anything else on this page that you would like to talk about? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily a new idea, but more self-assessment and realizing that this is why I have more corrections on my math map than my son has on his. <laughs> because my entire life, I have been a person who um, has to stop and make myself read all the parts and not skip steps. Yeah, we, we have to pay talk. attention. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Could you talk, the, the whisker plot thing at the top is familiar to me, but I don't quite understand. Well, this, this one looks pretty straightforward. I remember looking at this on pages, you know, like eight and 12 and 16. And I, I don't, I don't quite understand the boxes. Uh, mm, mm, yeah, there's just parts of that graph. I'm not sure what I'm, what I'm looking at. It's familiar and unfamiliar. Sure. So, um, so imagine the cat face isn't there and I'm going to just pull out my drawing pad really quickly here and turn on my annotation tool. Um, here we go. Okay. Okay. So, um, a box and whisker plot tells me, so that I uh, uses my five number summary and the five number summary is five, I could have any number of observations in my set of data. And my first number is always gonna be my minimum, the, the smallest number, I'm gonna have a maximum number. I'm gonna have my median, which is my middle number. It's the, the number that divides my set into the bottom half and the top half. And then I'm gonna have my first quartile and I'm gonna have my third quartile. So this is my 25% mark my 50% mark, my 75% mark, and my 100% mark. And, um, and so that's what we're looking at um, with our box and whisker plot. So we're told here that my set is the, uh, the number zero through six. So my minimum, my smallest, because it's in order already, is going to be my zeros. All right, there's my minimum. My maximum is six. My middle value, if I count, there's seven values. So I have one middle value, that's my three, which is my median. Because I have one middle value, I'm just gonna look at this group here, and this group here to figure out my quartiles. And I'm going to take the middle of those. So the middle value to my left is one, which is why that's underlined. My middle value to my right is five, which is why that is underlined. And so that becomes my five number summary. It that we're makes... using really simple examples, right? But when you have yes. a big, um, a big data set, um, it's really helpful to see right where things fall, um, especially in comparison to like an average. Um, if yes. my data is normally distributed, my average is going to be pretty close to the same as my median. But uh -huh. if um, my data is skewed one way or the other, my median and my, um, and my average can be really far apart. Right? Right. And so I might say, you know, my average income is, let's say $80,000, but my median income might be $50,000 because there's so many people that, right. There's, there's these people that have huge amounts of income. And so they, but there's not a lot of them, but they make a lot. And so they so pull my average it. up, it skews it right um, away from my median. Okay, thank you. That was really helpful. Thank you. 
You're welcome. All right. Well, we are right at two o'clock. So are there any last questions before we finish for today? All right, well, we will be back next week with um, our 4D, um, jumping into that. And I think you'll see where some of the things we talked about this week, especially with regarding time, um, we're gonna be applying that next week as we talk about 4D. So have a great week, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty. You're so welcome.